Final speaker for Founders Week 2017. Well, he's a dear, dear friend of Moody. Dr. Tony Evans. Tony's the founder and president of the Urban Alternative, a ministry for spiritual renewal through the church. He's senior pastor at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas. He earned his PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary, he served as associate professor there at the seminary in pastoral ministries. Get this, he's the author of more than 100 books, booklets, and Bible studies including The Kingdom Agenda, Marriage Matters, and The Battle is the Lord's. Tony's Moody Radio program, The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, is heard daily on nearly a thousand radio outlets throughout the United States and in more than 130 countries. In 2014, Moody Radio honored him with the Robert Neff Award. Tony and his wife Lois have four children, 12 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. <laughs> Please help me welcome our final speaker, Dr. Tony Evans. Well, good evening, and I am uh, honored and privileged to be here again at Moody. What a wonderful band and choirs, marvelous ministry and music, and I have thoroughly, along with my wife Lois, enjoyed uh, our time here already. My story intersects very intimately with Moody Bible Institute, although never having been a student here, whatever is in my legacy crosses Moody very intimately. It was Moody under Dr. Sweeting that opened up the opportunity for national radio when most stations in America would not accept a black speaker. And they opened that door for me, for which I will forever be grateful. When it came to publishing, my special relationship with Greg Thornton opened the door for publishing so that 40, nearly 40 of those 100 books have come from Moody Publishers and I'm forever grateful for that relationship. I'm grateful for the legacy of friends that God has given us here. Uh, friends of our ministry, uh, the Urban Alternative who keep us on radio and for which we are very grateful and will always be grateful. I'm thankful for Dr. Paul Nyquist. Thank you for your kindness and friendship. Of course, he's the ninth president of Moody. Actually, you should be the tenth president of Moody because the seventh president of Moody, Dr. Joe Stoll, and I had a bet. They had a men's conference. I was asked to speak. And I guess he was feeling his oats that day and he, he challenged me to a basketball game. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the bet? He said, you choose. I said, the presidency of Moody. <laughs> he accepted. We went to the Solheim Center all the men from the conference gathered for this one-on-one -on -one battle for the presidency of Moody Bible Institute. <laughs> he aptly demonstrated the truism that white men can't jump. <laughs> and so I walked away with a pretty easy victory But as many Anglos do, he denied me. 
my rightful opportunity. But in all seriousness, I am uh, elated at the opportunity to be here any time that the schedule permits that I am in, allowed to be part of something that you do is a privilege because on the human side of things, I clearly understand that I would not be doing what I'm doing at the level that God has allowed me to do it if God had not used Moody Bible Institute as a strategic partner in that relationship. So again, thank you for the history and friendship you've given us with Moody. My uh, next work with Moody is called Kingdom Disciples. It comes out this summer and we are excited about that book because it, it really reflects what my passion is and that is discipleship through the church. And so I want to call your attention to the premier passage on that subject known as the Great Commission in Matthew 28. I believe this is the calling of the church, the calling of schools like this who are equipping the next leaders of the church. And yet I think it is the missing link of the kingdom that is either not understood, under understood, or not applied and implemented for what it truly has to say. Those of you who are to any degree familiar with our ministry know that it is driven by a world view. It is my contention that the unifying theme of scripture is the glory of God through the advancement of his kingdom. That the beginning of Genesis and the end of Revelation has one overarching umbrella concern. His glory to advance his program and plan in history, which is called, throughout all of Scripture, his kingdom. The events throughout the Scripture cannot be threaded together unless you understand the concept of the kingdom and its various expressions through the nuances of Scripture. Currently, his kingdom program is being instituted and carried out through the church. Previously, it was to be instituted and carried out through the nation of Israel. That has been postponed until his coming kingdom. When I, in the 70s, when I was chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys, I would go work out with Roger Staubach and, and uh, Tony Dorsett and the known names of that era. And so before Bible study, I would go work out and I, I learned some of the plays. One of the plays called for a fly pattern. A fly pattern is a, is a pattern where the receiver runs straight down the field and the quarterback hurls the ball and tries to score a touchdown in one play. That's a fly pattern. But in the fly pattern, there was a signal given to the halfback who was then Tony Dorsett and the signal was to waggle. A waggle is a peel off to the side in case the original plan does not work, in case the receiver is too covered or the quarterback is too intense due to a blitz by the opposing team and therefore he does not have time to get off the long pass. He has this halfback peeling off to the side to receive the ball called a waggle and he will toss the ball to the halfback whose job it is were to accomplish what the original play that could not be executed was designed to achieve. God called a long distance pass to Israel. Israel was to receive the kingdom and bring in its glorious rule by Jesus Christ. Satan blitzed the play. When Satan blitzed the play, seeking to tackle the plan of God in the backfield, what he did not know was that God had a waggle off to the side called the church. And it was the job of the church to receive the ball called the kingdom and take it down the field until the original play is brought back onto the field of play called his millennial rule.
So between the postponement of Israel and the regathering of Israel, his kingdom program is to be recognized, established, implemented, and replicated through the church based on this call to discipleship. The Great Commission is one of five commissions in the New Testament. Matthew has a commission, Mark has a commission, Luke has a commission, John has a commission, and Acts has a commission. Each one of them has a commission. The other four commissions are concerned predominantly with the proclamation of the gospel. The good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the gift of eternal salvation to all who place faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. Unique, however, to the five commissions is the one in Matthew. Because Matthew introduces a term that none of the other four have, the Greek phrase is mathetes or make disciples. That term is not used in any of the other commissions, which is why this commission is called the Great One, why we have noted it to be unique among all the others, and yet it is the all-encompassing umbrella of God's strategic program in this age. When Jesus rose from the dead, he called a meeting. It is the only scheduled meeting called between his resurrection and his uh, death on the cross. Uh, rather, his death on the cross and resurrection and his ascension. There was a 40-day gap between his resurrection and his ascension where he had numbers of meetings, but this one is the only planned one. He calls three groups to the meeting. We're told in verse 16 that the 11 disciples attend this designated meeting to the mountain which he had assigned for the gathering to occur. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that more than 500 brethren came to meet with him. So we have a group of 511, the 11 are probably part of the 500, that nets us at least 489 who have gathered on the mountain to meet with the Lord to get final instructions about how they were to function during his absenteeism physically from planet Earth. There is a third group that also attends the meeting. Because the end of uh, verse 20 says, And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the age. Well, the age has not ended, which means you and I get to go to the meeting. So why don't we all wander up to the top of the mountain and find out what this meeting is all about? Since we have been invited to the meeting, we're included in the meeting, the message of the meeting is for all those who attended the meeting. And since we're attending the meeting, let's find out what we're meeting about. Jesus Christ calls the meeting to order, and when he calls the meeting to order, they began to worship him. They, they began to celebrate him. They began to glorify him. They began to acknowledge him. Perhaps songs was part of the gathering. All we know is that there was a worship service taking place at the meeting, much as we have experienced thus far tonight. Jesus Christ then takes the platform after the worship. There were some in the midst of the worship who had questions. It said some were doubtful in verse, 12, uh, in verse 17. Some had question marks. They weren't fully buying in to the resurrected Christ. They were not fully buying in to all they had heard and learned and seen and experienced. They had question marks. And perhaps there are some here tonight who have gathered in this worship service prior to the message being spoken, as was in their case, who have come here with question marks. Question marks about the reality of this Christian faith. Question marks about the power of this Jesus Christ. Question marks about how to deal with the reality of the culture in which you are to live your Christian life. It said some had questions, but even though they had questions, their questions did not keep them home. They came to the meeting. So we can only assume, even if there are those here who have questions, your questions drove you out. They didn't keep you home, so you're in the right worship service. And Jesus Christ stands before 
his 489 or so who are physically present and the millions who would be invited to the meeting because they would become part of the age to which the message applied and he throws a bombshell when he says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That is a kingdom summary for the kingdom is the rule of God over all that God has created. Therefore, the kingdom rules up there and down here. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. To put it in everyday colloquial language, Jesus is saying, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge in heaven and in history. I'm in charge in eternity and in time. I am in charge of all that has been placed under the creative genius of Almighty God. I am in charge now. He chooses an interesting word to declare his right to rule. He chooses the word authority, which in the Greek text is ekousia. There are numbers of words for power and authority in the scripture. The most well-known and noted Greek term is dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite, which has to do with the, the expression of explosive power. But that's not the word he chooses to use. He chooses to use the Greek term ekousia. Ekousia has to do with authority in legitimate hands. It has to do with the right to exercise power because everybody who has power doesn't have the right to exercise it. I often use, when I use my kingdom analogy of referees in a football game, the players are younger, stronger, and faster. The refs are older, fatter, and slower. <laughs> the players have uh, dunamis, but the refs have ekousia. <laughs> the players can knock you down, but the refs can put you out. <laughs> because what they carry is New York authority. 345 Park Avenue in New York, um, well that's where the NFL offices are located. And they have representatives on the field of play called referees. These refs have been given a book and that book is the basis of all their decisions on the field of play. And so everything on the field must be subjected to those refs and the decisions that they make. The players have power but the refs have ecousia they reach in their back pocket, they throw out a yellow flag and blow a, blow a whistle and they shut that mama down. <laughs> because they have ecousia, they have a legitimate exercise of power given to them by the offices in New York headed by a commissioner who has deputized them to represent that office on this field. When Jesus Christ says, all authority has been given unto me, he is declaring that he has the right to rule. He has the final say so. He is absolutely authoritative in history as he is now in heaven. He is in charge now. Satan may have power. Jesus has authority. On the cross of Jesus Christ, he ripped away the authority of Satan, not the power. The devil is still powerful, but he no longer has legitimate authority. If you hold a gun on me, you've got power over me. You can tell me to sit down and I'm going to sit down. You tell me to stand up and I'm going to stand up. You tell me whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do because you've got a gun on me, which means you have the power. But if I ever discover that there are no bullets in the gun, the story just changed. <laughs> if I ever discovered that you've been tricking me, to make me think you got more clout than you really have, I'm going to take off my jacket and we're going to get this mama on. Because I've discovered you are exercising power with not having legitimate authority. What Jesus Christ says is no matter who, what you face in the world in which I am sending out to you, you have authority because I decapitated the bullets on the cross. And so Satan does not have the final say-so in your life, in your circumstances, or in the mission to which I am assigning you. All authority belongs to me. 
when you understand that, when that reference point is your orientation, it changes how you look at life, it changes how you live life, it changes the confidence in which you minister and carry out the mission that God has called you to carry out because he says, I'm in charge now. I was in New York. When I was in New York, I was uh, at the Marriott Marquis Hotel. I had to check out. And so I checked out of the Marriott Hotel and I had to catch a plane because I had to speak in Chicago. And so I came to Chicago, came downtown Chicago, went into the Hilton Hotel, cold outside, like, it, like it's always in Chicago. It was cold outside <laughs> in the middle of winter. The hawk was biting and and so I, uh, I took my bags up to this high floor. I put my key in the, the door, click, click, red light, click, click, red light, click, click, red light. The door wouldn't open, now I'm evangelically ticked off. Because <laughs> it's cold outside, and I done walked up all these, uh, uh, gone up all these floors, and now the key doesn't work. So I took the elevator back downstairs, and I went to the, to the registration desk and I said, excuse me, he said, I said, this key doesn't work. He said, excuse me, sir, that key doesn't go to this hotel. <laughs> See, I was using my Marriott key that I hadn't thrown away in a Hilton lock and those kingdoms don't mix. You see, one of the reasons we're not exercising authority is we're using the wrong keys and we wonder why things aren't happening like they should be happening. Victory is not being achieved where victory ought to be achieved because he said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom and only my keys work in the doors to my kingdom rule. And there is authority in this kingdom rule. It's agusia. It's authority in legitimate hands. At the heart of the kingdom and at the heart of being a kingdom disciple is authority. That's at the heart of it. It's not just having programs, it's not just having preaching, it's not just having ministry, it's authority. All authority belongs to me, therefore, make disciples. What in the world is making disciples have to do with the introduction to your message? All authority belongs to me, and the next word out of your mouth is make disciples. Because the concern of Jesus is the transfer of kingdom authority. He not only wants to transfer Christians, he wants to transfer authority. When you read throughout the books of the Gospels, particularly in the book of Luke, like in Luke chapter 9, it says he sent them out with the message of the kingdom and gave them authority. With the kingdom for his disciples came authority. So if authority is missing in the church, if authority is missing in our lives, it is because we have not yet become disciples, so transfer of authority was unwarranted. For Jesus will only transfer his authority to disciples. All Christians don't get to exercise authority. Only mafe takes make disciples get to plug into what this commission is about, which is to exercise kingdom authority on behalf of the king who's been designated the regent over the whole universe to rule on the father's behalf in history through his people and to deputize them with kingdom authority. The right to act on his behalf as Jesus had the right to act on his father's behalf. So this issue of discipleship is not just Bible studies. It's exercising authority. And if there is not the exercising of kingdom authority, there is not the understanding and or application of discipleship. So that raises a question. What is discipleship? What is this mathetes? This was not a uniquely Christian word. If you would have been walking up the, down the streets of Rome, you would have heard them regularly using the term. Mathetes had to do with a transference of data for the purpose of implementation in the world. Plato developed a system of philosophy 
Platonic thought that separated nature and the physical realm. The spiritual realm and the physical realm became two separate compartments. Today, you would call it sacred and secular. He, he instituted this division of time and space, the metaphysical from the physical. And when he did that, and that became a worldview, that worldview was picked up by a young man named Aristotle. Aristotle developed a logical continuum from the thought of Plato into the structure of Aristotle, which came to be known as Aristotelian logic. So Aristotle took the thinking of Plato, organized it into a system, and built schools. Those schools were known as academies, which is what we use today to refer to educational institutions. And these academies were training centers in Platonic thought through Aristotelian logic in order that they might implement that thinking in the world in which they lived. So powerful was Platonic thought through Aristotelian thinking that it affected the whole Roman world. We call it the Hellenization of Rome where Greek culture was dominant because of the thinking of Plato organized through Aristotle so that the teachers and the doctors and the lawyers and the Senate members were all reflecting this worldview in their various spheres of occupation, dominating the culture even though Rome was the military power. So when Jesus chose this word, he intentionally chose a word that had to do with transference of a worldview into the contemporary society in which they lived, worked, played, raised families. So when Jesus talks about making disciples, he's not just talking about getting people out of hell to heaven. He's talking about getting heaven into history. That's why Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 are so powerful because it says Jesus Christ is over all things. Same thing as in this passage, heaven and earth. But it says even though he's over all things, he's only been given to one thing, given to the church. Why? Which is his body, the implementation mechanism of his authority. What is the job of this body? It says to fill all in all. That is to disseminate the authority of Christ in every crease and crevice of the culture. To disseminate his authority in whatever sphere that they've been given to exercise their spiritual presence. He says, and when they fill all in all, I will fill them. So I'm over everything, but the everything I'm over doesn't know I'm over it. Only the church knows I'm over it. But I will fill the church as they fill the all things that I really am over who don't know I'm over it. But when they enter into it, they will know I'm over it because of the representatives I have on it that are reflecting me in it. And when they do that, I will join them to empower them with my authority to exercise in the world in which they find themselves. It is about the understanding and the exercising of kingdom authority. Uh, my son has taken over for me with the Cowboys and the Mavericks as chaplain when he finished playing in the NFL. And, and uh, when, I was, when I was there, uh, they would give me tickets to the game. And when they gave me tickets to the game, I would carry people with me. But I would tell them, don't drive, don't drive to the game because it's the parking is going to be $15 a car. It's going to take you a long time to walk to the general. I said, don't do that. I said, come with me. I said, because I have premium parking right across the street from the stadium, so, uh, uh, from the airline center. So you come with me because if you come with me, you park for free because you're in my car. Now you park for free, not because of who you are, but because of who I am. They don't know you, but they know me. But because you're with me, they're going to accept you. We're not going through the general public entrance. We're going through a private entrance. You go through that private entrance, they'll reject you. You go through that private entrance with me, they will accept you. Not because they know you, but because they know me. But because you're with me, they will accept you. We're going to go downstairs to a three-course meal. You hungry? You don't have to buy food. Why? Because you're with me. And if you with me, you get to piggyback off the rights and privileges that belong to me. 
And when the game is over, you don't have to rush out because we're not going that way. We're going out a private entrance, on a private elevator, through a private exit, to a private parking lot, and we will be halfway home before most of the folks have reached their car. <laughs> and all of that will have happened, and it has absolutely nothing to do with you. It's got to do with me. But if you stick close to me, I'll transfer the rights and privileges that belong to me to you so that you can piggyback on my authority. What Jesus is saying is all authority is given unto me and I'm interested in transferring it to disciples only. These are visible verbal followers of Christ who have come to the place where they have learned to bring all of life under the rule of Jesus Christ. Today we have part-time Christians when Jesus is looking for full-time saints. We have people who are Christians on Sunday and they become whatever the culture needs them to be on Monday. We have Christians who are convenient Christians. When it does not inconvenience them, when it does not trouble them, when they have to choose between what's godly and what's governmental, when they have to choose between what's righteous and what's popular, they often uh, do a Benedict Arnold on the cross. No, a disciple is one who is bringing all of life under the rulership of Jesus Christ so that he has the last say-so on whatever the subject matter happens to be. Only then does he feel comfortable transferring your, his authority. My son Anthony, who's our singer in the family, which was received from him by his mother only, reminded me of this uh, and I remembered this when he first started his uh, gospel singing career. Uh, he was a poor singer just kind of getting his feet wet. He said, Dad, would you pick me up from the airport? Because, uh, you know, I, you know I, 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 need, I don't have a, the way to do this. Could you pick me up? I said, yeah, give me the information. So I went to pick him up from the airport. Now, this was before all of the different things that have changed due to 9-11. And, and so I went to the gate to pick him up. He's about the third person off the plane and we're now walking to baggage claim. On our way to baggage claim, halfway I stop. I just stop on our way there and I look at him. And I said to him, oh no you didn't. No you didn't. And he started laughing. <laughs> Now the reason he was laughing and he knew what I was talking about is because in order to be the third person off the plane, you in first class. That's the only way you get to be the third person off the plane. You got to be in first class. But he didn't have first class ticket, he didn't have first class money. What he had was my name. <laughs> See, his name is Anthony Evans Jr. So I knew what he had done. He had gone up there and said, my name is Tony Evans, Anthony Evans. Uh, I'm an executive platinum flyer, and I would like to know if there are any upgrades available. The lady said, oh, thank you, Dr. Evans. We're glad to have you follow flying with us today. And he got bumped up, but it wasn't bumped up because of who he was. It was bumped up because he knew somebody and he shared the name. And because he shared the name, he could piggyback on the authority. See, unless you're willing to share the name, you don't get to be bumped up on Jesus' authority. There must be the declaration that I come under his rule. I am identified with him and I exercise kingdom authority because I'm not just merely a Christian. I'm a fully attached disciple of Jesus Christ who brings all of his life under divine rule. And until that's done, authority is withheld. So you wind up with church. Now, nothing wrong with church. I believe in church. Church is critical, but that's all you wind up with. Because when you go back out into the worker day world, when you get back out into politics and sociology and education and whatever your sphere of responsibility is, you find out there's no authority here. Why is there no authority out there when there's all these Christians in here? I mean, wait a minute. You and I will never travel again like we traveled before 9-11. 9-11 has forever changed our trajectory of travel. 
I mean, security is everywhere, cameras are everywhere. You will never have that free flow that you had before 9-11. That is because 19 men came to our country in the name of their faith and shut America down. Now help me, how can 19 men from halfway around the world in the name of their faith shut the most powerful country in the world down. I will tell you how. Because they were disciples of their belief system. They were fully committed, fully engaged, representatives of their belief system. Now if 19 men can shut down the most powerful nation in the world in the name of a faulty belief system, how much more do you think believers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can enter the culture and impact it for the glory of God piggybacking off of divine authority? Help me. How can we have all these churches on all these corners with all these Christians and all these programs and all these ministers and all these ministries and all this activity and all these facilities and still have all this mess as a dead monkey on the line somewhere? Jesus stood up before his disciples and in the ages of which we are a part and he says, I'm in charge now. So the one thing you should be experiencing amidst all the opposition that the culture is offering, the one thing you should be experiencing is authority. Because I'm in charge now. I'm, I'm calling the shots. Not my father, my father has delegated it to me. Belief in God is nice. But when it comes to operating in history, no, it, that's me. For the father has turned over everything to the son. So it's not about God the Father. See, in the Old Testament, it was all God the Father. You, you saw a little bit of Jesus, you saw a little bit of Holy Spirit, but God the Father was the front page. In the Gospels, it was Jesus the Son. And he says, now I'm going to leave here, so in the church age, it's going to be the Holy Spirit representing me like I represented the Father. And the only thing the Holy Spirit will share authority with is when you make a big deal about me, for he is here to glorify me. It's all about me. And that has to do with the transfer of authority. So you need to do three things, he says, if you're going to be my disciple. He surrounds this imperative, make disciples with three participles, going, baptizing, and teaching. The first one can be translated as you go. As you go, what does that mean, as you go? You can study the word go in Hebrew, Greek, Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, and go means go. <laughs> it means don't stay. This is the word that was used in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus told his disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to tell them Messiah has come. It was a messianic instruction of evangelism. When he says go, he is talking about to deliver the messianic message. It is to proclaim what the other commissions talk about, the good news of Jesus Christ. To not be ashamed to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. It means that you invite people to enter into the family of God unapologetically. It means that you are a witness for the cross and you invite people into eternal life at no cost to them because the price has already been paid. It is to deliver the messianic message. It is to be clear that you and I are dispensers of the gospel, the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then he says, baptize them. Does he mean get them wet? What does he mean? He gives a formula, baptize them in the name singular of three pronouns, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You wouldn't have word the name singular unless these three pronouns are one. Trinitize them. Don't just get them wet. The Greek word baptizo was a very interesting word because it was used of a, a dye maker. If a mother back then wanted to make her daughter a blue dress, she would buy the cloth 
and then she would dip the cloth into, uh, she would take it to the dye maker and he would dip the cloth into blue dye, dry it, so she now had blue dye, blue cloth to make her daughter a blue dress, or red or pink or yellow or whatever the color happened to be. It was a reclassification and a re-identification of the color of the cloth in order to produce the clothes that the mother wanted to make. So he immersed, he dipped the cloth in the dye in order to re-identify it, that is, change its color. When Paul talks about the spiritual baptism of the believer in Romans chapter 6, he says, we were baptized into his death. What this means, brothers and sisters, is that your identity must first be Christian. Your identity cannot first be black, it cannot first be white, it cannot be first Democrat, it cannot first be Republican, it not first can be poor, it cannot first be rich. It must be, you must come out clearly as a representative of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can't even say you're a black Christian or a white Christian because then you make black and white an adjective and you make Christian a noun. It's the job of the adjective to modify the noun. So if you've got Christianity in the noun position and your color in the adjectival position, you've got to keep changing the noun so it reflects the color you declared it to be. Christianity must always be in the adjectival position. Your culture, your, your politics, your class must always be in the noun position so that if anything changes, it's the noun of your humanity and not the adjective of your faith. Christianity must define your identity. You must be a follower of Christ first. I don't care how your mother raised you. I don't care how your daddy raised you. I don't care, I don't care what your background is. It must be now made subject to the cross. It's like when Peter, when Peter was, was uh, eating pork chops with the Gentiles. He was eating pork chops with the Gentiles because all of his life, his mama had to keep him from soul food. His mama had to keep him from soul food because he couldn't eat pork. But then he had this sheet come down from heaven to say, don't call unclean what I call clean. And he found out them Gentiles knew how to cook. So he went across the railroad tracks to the soul shack and he found out about pig feet and pork chops and chitlins. And, 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 and he decided, ooh, this stuff is mm -mm good. And so he's sitting down eating with the Gentiles. But then some of his boys from the hood show showed up. Some of, his, some of his posse showed up and when his posse showed up they said why are you eating with them? We got to live with them in heaven. That don't mean we got to dine with them on earth. And it says that Peter got so intimidated that he got up from eating with the Gentiles because he was intimidated by the circumcision. The Jews, it said it got so bad that the rest of the Jews were with him because a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. So when Joshua, when, when, when uh, 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 Peter was wrong, the rest of the Jews were eating with them. Well they went wrong too. Bad leadership make bad congregations. And then it says, so the Gentiles are insulted because of what happens. It even goes to say, and Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Not my boy Barney, anybody but Barney. Barney, uh, you know, he's the son of encouragement. I mean, Barnabas, the reason he's highlighted is because he's born in Cyprus. Cyprus is a Roman Gentile colony. So he went to school with Gentiles, played ball with Gentiles. But that's how bad racism is. It'll make a good man bad. So even Barnabas got away and was carried away with their hypocrisy. And he would have gotten away with it too, except for Paul wanted some pork chops too. So Paul has shown up and Paul said, and when I saw that he was not acting in concert with the truth of the gospel. Wait a minute, this got to do with race, this got to do with culture. What the gospel's got to do with this? Because the good news of the gospel is not just the free gift out of hell into heaven, the, the good news of the gospel is that these two have been made one under the cross. That is also the good news of the gospel. And so he says, when I saw that they were not acting in concert with the truth of the gospel, I didn't hold a private meeting. I didn't have a, a private seminar, can't we all get along? I condemned Peter in front of them all because it doesn't take 250 years to solve a problem that could be solved in two minutes and 30 seconds when people are under kingdom authority. He says, I condemn them all. And my favorite verse in the New Testament Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I yet live, yet not I, it's Christ who lives in me, the life which I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Well, guess what? That comes at the end of this story. We quote that verse without seeing the story. Paul is talking to Peter and telling Peter, boy, you got the wrong identity. You're supposed to be Christian first, not Jew first. All your Jewishness. Now, God is not expecting everybody to be alike. He's not expecting you to like soul music, and he's not expecting me to like country and western, thank God. What he is saying is, I expect you to be Christian first. We've allowed contemporary politics to separate. Most Anglo-Christians have been Republican, the evangelical movement to put in the current president. Most African-American Christians concerned about justice, 94% of them voted Democratic. Those two different worldviews. The problem is when that is allowed to interfere with the kingdom of God. Because God doesn't ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He is the consummate independent. He only votes for himself. So no matter who you voted for, when you come out of that voting booth, you live for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not for the Democrats or the Republicans. You belong to another kingdom. And all other kingdoms. <laughs> Reminds me of Joshua 5. Joshua 5, uh, uh, he comes out, he's doing reconnaissance around Jericho, you know, checking the walls out, saying how he's going to take over this thing. He sees this huge guy dressed in battle array. This huge guy is coming dressed all in battle array, and Joshua's mama ain't raised no dummy. Whose side are you on? Are you on their side? Because if you're on their side, then we got to fight you and them. If you're on our side, you're going to help us fight them. So before I go any further, whose side are you on? He said, I think you're confused. <laughs> I'm neither on their side, and you're the people of God, and I'm not even on your side. I'm captain of the Lord's army. I ain't come to take sides. I come to take over. I ain't come to, I ain't come to choose like that. Don't put me in your limited political viewpoint because I'm in charge now. And until we get this in chargeness of Jesus Christ, we'll stay divided illegitimately with no authority. We'll have prayer meetings with no answers because there's no authority. He says, you baptize them, you reclassify them. Let them know they're to be Christians first. Let them know that they're to bleed red, that their association with me is their new point of reference. And then he says, the third part of simple, teach them. What do you teach them? Pneumatology, ecclesiology, eschatology, angelology, anthropology, hamartiology? What? What do you teach them? No, I didn't say that. Teach them to observe whatever I have commanded you. Teach them application. Teach them to use it, not just to know it. Teach them to apply it, not just to memorize it. Teach them to execute it, to observe, is to, 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 to put it into implementation, not just information. Today we've got plenty of information. Our problem is execution. Far too many Christians want to audit the Christian life. Audit is where you go to get the information, but you don't have responsibility for any of the work. You don't have to take any of the test. You just want the data. Far too many of God's children go to church for the data, but they want to audit the truth. And so it takes us as long to fix things as it takes the unregenerate to fix it. In fact, they fix some things before we do. And the church of Jesus Christ plays catch up because we're not exercising authority. Jesus says, I'm in charge now. And then he concludes. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Mm, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Okay, the age has not ended yet. The rapture has not occurred, so, so this applies to us. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Now, in the Greek text, the word I is written twice. We call it the ego I me construction. The ego I me construction literally reads, I, even I, will be with you always. They don't write in your English versions the word I twice. They just intensify it by saying, and lo, I, 
So they intensify it, but in the Greek, it's I, even I. Wait a minute. Why is he announcing himself twice? He's already in the pulpit. He's already preaching. They're already looking at him. Yet he says, I, oh, let me make sure you got that. I will be with you always. You see, in verse 19, he says, baptize him in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he names the whole trinity in verse 19. He says, trinitize them. So when they go out, they go out as representatives of the Godhead. They are representing God no matter where they are. They're not just doctors, they're God's representative in medicine. So the medical field sees what God looks like when God helps hurting people. They're not just lawyers, they're God's representative in the Bar Association. So the Bar Association sees what God looks like when God tries a case. They're not just teachers, they're God's representative in the educational field. So the educational field sees what God looks like when God teaches a lesson. They're not just home, home uh, 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 workers, they're, they're God's representative in the home. So the home gets to see what God looks like when God raises the next generation. Trinitize them. So that they understand that they're representing the Godhead among the nations. Because he says disciple, the nation. So he's not talking about in church discipleship. He's talking about in public discipleship. He says, now if you will be my representatives publicly, because you cannot be my disciple and a secret agent Christian. You cannot be my disciple and a spiritual CIA representative. You cannot be my disciple and a covert operative. Everybody else is coming out the closet. You might as well come out the closet too. You can only be my disciples if the nation see it. And if you will be my Trinitarian representatives publicly, I, even I, will be with you. And I know we like to quote that verse when people are sick, well, you know, the Lord said he'd be with you. When people are struggling, the Lord said he'd be with you. And all that's true. There are many passages that will support that, but not this one. This passage is not talking about him being your comforter. This passage is not talking about him uh, uh, coming alongside you when you're struggling. you got other passages for that. He's only talking about one thing, the transfer of kingdom authority through disciples. That's his only subject. And what he is saying is... I will be my, I meaning not my daddy, not the Holy Spirit, because I'm the one who's been designated. I will show up with my authority, my keys, my rule, if you're this kind of follower. I will transfer authority to you. I, even I, not my daddy, not the spirit, because all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. I will bring that authority to you, if you're this kind of Christian. Not if you're a church member, not if you're religious, not if you go to small group Bible study, all that's good, but I want to know, are you a visible, verbal, no holes barred, representative of me in the culture? And if you are that, I, even I, will take special notice of you. Because as I said earlier, Jesus does not have the same relationship with all Christians. He does not. Even among his disciples, there was Peter, James, and John. There was the 12. There was the 70. There's the 120. He yeah, only three went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Everybody didn't get the same amount of everything. In fact, the last couple of verses in John chapter 2, it says many believed on him. Pistuo ice in the Greek, that always means folk getting saved in the book of John. He says, many pistuo iced him, many believed on him, many were converted. But then it says, but he would not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. That is, they had gotten saved, but they had not yet gotten fully committed. And he wasn't about to share his authority with part-time Christians. Nor is he about to share that authority with part-time saints today. So my challenge today to you, to me, to us, and to the church is to not only get converted for heaven, that, that is clearly the first step to enter the kingdom, but we're talking about sharing the authority of the kingdom because the whole purpose of leaving us here was to exercise kingdom authority, to go public and declare your allegiance to Jesus Christ in word and in deed in every sphere of life. 
And so for my life in ministry, it's men becoming a kingdom man, woman becoming a kingdom woman, parents raising kingdom kids, having a kingdom marriage, because it's all about the king. It ain't about you being happy. It's about the king. It's all about the king. And until it's all about the king, he will hold on to his authority. A man, in closing, was taking his bride to their honeymoon. They were driving down a road, a dark country road. It was foggy out, very foggy. He wanted to pass a truck that was in front of him. He pulled out to pass the truck and didn't see the oncoming van. Head-on collision. Flipped the car up and knocked it over into a ditch on a country road. In the evening, isolated. Both were knocked unconscious. The husband behind the wheel came to first, and he looked at his brand new bride gushing with blood, unconscious. He knew that if they didn't get help soon, she would bleed out and die. What could he do? He's on this isolated country road. But as fortune would have it, he sees a little sign on the top of the hill in front of the car. It says, Office of Dr. Bill Jones. How fortunate could that be? He runs around, opens the door, picks up his bride. She's bleeding all over him, stumbles up the hill, and knocks on the door. An old gentleman comes to the door. The young man says, help, help, save her. The old man said, I, I, I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't do that anymore. The young man with bewilderment looked at him and he said, Mister, you have two choices. Save her or take down your sign. But don't give me the impression by what I read that I can come here and be delivered. I can come here and be fixed. I can come here and be transformed because your sign said, Dr. Bill Jones, don't let me show up here and you tell me that's not what you do anymore because things are too bad for you not to do this anymore. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got two options. Either become a fully invested disciple, representative, kingdom emissary of Jesus Christ or take down the sign, but don't fool folk. Making them think you are belonging to the King of Kings, representing heaven on earth. Don't trick people into thinking that you've got all of God and a bag of chips. Don't, don't throw them a curveball. Take down the sign or let's get to work and advertise. All authority belongs to him. If you want to see what that looks like, Check me out. I'm one of his deputized representatives. <laughs> Father, bless your word in the life of your people and make of us disciples who are fully committed to representing you. Forgive us for those areas in which we have not done so. Grow us in the areas where we still need help. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen.